What is a part of history that we consider to be a fact is 100% fake? Story 1. Corsets were not typically tight-laced. They were only tight-laced by the highly fashionable women, and usually only for particular events or portraits. Corsets were designed to be comfortable. Women wore a cotton layer underneath the corset, so it didn't rub against the skin. The corset was more like a bra, a bit, instead of using the shoulders to support it, use the whole torso. Some people claim they are much more comfortable than modern bras. The intense proportions of the past were achieved with corsets and padding. Tight lacing was uncommon, but layers of petticoats or hoops or bum rolls or whatever else at the time was very common to give women the trendy body shape at the time. Story 2. The lady who sued McDonald's didn't do so frivolously. She received third-degree burns from how hot that coffee was and needed a skin graft. It was quickly found that that location was keeping the coffee well above the temperature you can legally serve a hot drink in a cup at. The fact that most people think this suit was over the temperature of the coffee and not the debilitating burns that woman received is one of the PR world's greatest triumphs. You are not immune to propaganda. Story 3. Ninjas dressed in all to stay stealthy in the night or something like that. Ninjas dressed like normal people to blend in. The all look stemmed from Japanese theater to make it more obvious to the audience who the ninjas were. If they wore all, it'd be quite obvious, and they'd stick out like a sore thumb edit. Most of you pointed out it also came from stagehands. That makes a lot of sense, too. Story 4. So many people completely misunderstand pre-industrial lifespans. The average age of death was 30, not because our bodies wore out faster, but because of how averages are calculated. A lot of people passed away as children. A much larger chunk of the population passed away in wars. If you got in an accident, healing B without modern medicine was difficult. But for people who reached adulthood and then avoided violence, injury, and plague, living to be 60 or 70 was pretty normal. Story 5. The people use swords and axes all the time. Spears. It's spears. Most of human history has been spears. Vikings used spears. Samurai and knights used spears. Hell. Bayonets exist because people felt you always need a spear, even with a rifle in your hand. William Blake said, When the stars threw down their spears and watered heaven with their tears, which is stupid. No one throws down their spear. Spears are great for poking people to death. Story 6. This is a little niche, but it's been a long-held belief in the gaming community that one of Nintendo's business ventures before getting into the video game market was love hotels, hourly hotels whose main purpose is to knock boots in. This has been repeated as fact alongside their other historical ventures like playing cards, taxis, instant food, and toys. But last year, a Nintendo enthusiast did a dive into their historical financial records and found no definitive proof that they ever ran or were associated with love hotels in any way. Story 7. Pretty much most of the common public image of the Stone Age. Paleolithic peoples didn't primarily live in caves. They were used for habitation sometimes but tents or even relatively permanent huts were probably far more common. Art caves, like those found in France and Spain, often show no signs of habitation at all. They weren't stupid, brutish ape people. Anatomically, modern humans emerged at least 7,100 IKEA 200K years ago, thanks to several comments who pointed out my mistake, and there's nothing to suggest they would have been intellectually inferior to us. Even Neanderthals probably were relatively close to us. And it's questionable if you'd even realize it wasn't a Homo sapiens if you met one. H. Sapiens definitely, and Neanderthals probably wore ornaments of various kinds. Even H. Erectus likely was broadly human in appearance and behavior. You have to go back in time a long way before you'd consider early hominids more animal than human. Generally, even imagining the Stone Age as some sort of coherent period of human history is misleading. It's a periodization based on materials used. Even though there is sometimes a remarkable cultural uniformity over long periods of time and large distances in Stone Age Europe, even single cultures span many thousands of years. Worldviews and even lifestyles must have changed many times even during periods we now consider uniform. In fact, even the name Stone Age is misleading. A lot of tools were made from flint or similar material if available, but that's just the material that preserves the best. Wood, bone, clay, plant fibers, furs, etc. were also used. They just usually didn't survive long enough for us to find. It's likely that Southeast Asian pre-metallic cultures even used bamboo in a similar way flint and bone was used in Europe. Story 8. The idea that Vikings, early medieval Norsemen, were dirty barbarians with shaggy hair and wild beards who wore leathers and furs. In reality, Vikings were notorious for being very clean by medieval standards. 
bathing every day and washing their hair. They wore shoulder-length, very well-combed hair, which they sometimes lightly bleached with potash to accentuate the blonde. They wore short, very neat beards and carefully trimmed stash. Later on in the Viking Age, some wore undercut, crew-cut kind of a trim, but with longer bangs. Instead of leathers, which they almost never wore, they had woolen clothes in bright colors, with blues and pinks being particularly popular. They almost never wore actual fur, they sold it all, and instead wore fake fur made of pulled wool, basically fur rug trim. Instead of crusty savages, they were fabulous, clean and neatly fashionable, to the point that the Church Chronicles of England note that this excessive dandiness was dangerous in itself, because it helped them lead Christian women astray. Still, of course, they were quite often murderers, slavers, thieves, and raiders. Just fabulous ones. Story 9. That historically people, especially the peasant class of medieval Europe, stank. This is born of two factoids. Firstly, that people very rarely if ever had baths, and secondly, that people rarely if ever washed their clothes. Both are kind of true but misleading, and with massive caveats. First, bathing. Think of the amount of work involved in preparing a bath in the days before hot running water. You go to the well, get a bucket of water, lug it back across the village to your house, put it in a pan over the fire to heat it up. That's one bucket. You'd have to do that half a dozen times at least. Even if you've got servants to do all the actual work, it would take a lot of servants a lot of time to get you a bath ready. But that doesn't mean people didn't wash. Most people washed daily, using a basin of water and a cloth, basically a sponge bath. Soap made of animal fat and ash has been around for thousands of years and is pretty effective at lifting dirt off the skin. As any one of us who's had to sponge bathe for a while, for example, after a surgery, well, no, it may not be ideal, but it gets the job done. Films generally portray peasant with smudges of dirt all over the face, but that's just lazy costuming. And now the clothes. True, the outer layers the layers that we see, were very rarely washed because most people only owned one set and they could be very difficult to wash effectively. But you have to remember people, even peasants, wore a lot of layers so that the layer we see was really the equivalent of a coat and was never really against the wearer's skin gathering sweat. How often do you wash your outer coat? For people in roles where external dirt was very likely to get onto the clothes, aprons and other easily removable garments were used. The layers worn right against the skin, a full dress-like smock for women and a long shirt for men, long enough to tuck around the genitals and butt, and also do the job of underpants, were changed and washed as often as possible, because they were the layers that got the body sweat etc. on them. They were made more simply, and usually of cheap, hardy fabric specifically designed for easy laundering. Story 10. Rabbits cannot live on a diet of carrots and fruits. It's like asking a toddler to live on a diet of candy. They also cannot live on a diet of completely lettuce and leaves, though it's close. Rabbits need, need, need hay for a healthy diet, and pellets are heavily recommended as well, though they also have limits, should be in the bag according to the bunny's weight. Greens are good, not to be the main, main diet, and fruits or carrots can be given as treats. Bugs Bunny led a lot of people to believe rabbits live off of carrots. They do not. They will pass away if you expect them to live on a diet of 100% carrots. Story 11. That Hitler was a raging, shouting maniac in person. I think we want to believe that he would be that way, because the idea that someone who was polite and low-key could be so evil is really disturbing. According to his personal secretary and many people who knew him, Hitler rarely showed anger and was subdued but friendly in private. Traudel Junga was there during the incident that inspired the scene in the movie Downfall that became a meme, and she said that she was completely shocked to hear Hitler raise his voice. She had worked for him for over two years. Story 12. Under God was not in the original version of the Pledge of... The Pledge was written in 1892. It wasn't until 1954 that President Eisenhower added Under God in response to fear of communism during WW2. Also, when first implemented, during the pledge, people raised their right arm forward so the hand was level with their eyes, directed at the flag. However, this was changed during WW2 because it resembled the Nazi salute. The procedure was changed to place the right hand over the heart. Story 13. Carrots are good for eye health, but won't improve your eyesight. Nevertheless, people have been telling me all my life I should eat carrots to see better. The reason people think that is during WW2, the Royal Air Force had this new radar system, and they didn't want the Germans to know about it. 
So they spread the rumor that the reason their pilots could find their planes so fast was that they ate carrots. Edit. See top comment below from Will and Daffa's Hugh Cock. Great username. I've probably been duped also. Story 14. That the Library of Alexandria being burned down set humanity back hundreds or even thousands of years. At the time that it was finally destroyed in 48 BC, most of its collection had already been copied and distributed to other libraries and universities, or the important scrolls were relocated. It was no longer an important meeting place for great scholars either, and it's not entirely clear how much of it was even destroyed during the fire, as many believe that it was even partially rebuilt afterwards. It ultimately just fell out of relevance throughout the years, and didn't really take any of the information stored within with it. Story 15 that after the first failed assassination attempt, Gavrilo Princip went to eat a sandwich at a cafe, and Archduke Franz Ferdinand just happened to stop right in front of him. This is partially true. Ferdinand's driver really did make a wrong turn at exactly the wrong place, and Princip did get pretty lucky, but he hadn't just given up. The reason for the driver's confusion was that he didn't know he was supposed to continue along the Appel Quay to go to the hospital, and instead followed the original published route. Princip had gone there not to eat at the delicatessen, but out of hope that Ferdinand would come that way. Princip was given a full trial with multiple witnesses. Nobody ever said anything about him eating anything, much less a sandwich, which would have been extremely uncommon in Serbia-Bosnia at the time. The myth likely originates from, of all things, a Brazilian novel about a twelve-fingered assassin translated into English and published in the UK and US in 2001. There is no known account of the myth which predates this. Main source, edit, Sarajevo is in Bosnia, not Serbia, much to the chagrin of Princip's ghost, I'm sure. Story 16, that Catherine Howard, fifth wife of Henry VIII, was a promiscuous adulterer who had many affairs while married to the king. In reality, she was a child who was groomed and or assaulted by no less than four men, including the king, whom she was supposed to be able to trust, and the king disappeared her for it. The same goes for Anne Boleyn, his second wife. She never committed adultery, incest, or witchcraft, but was disappeared because the king's cronies didn't like how much influence she had over him, so they turned him against her. He also used the fact that she couldn't bear him a son as further ammo. Story 17. That when Europeans first arrived on the east coast of what is now the U.S., the land was very sparsely populated, and so there was a lot of free land to settle. At least that's what I've been taught in school. In reality, it turns out the coast was densely populated with native settlements to the point where Europeans couldn't even disembark because the natives wouldn't allow them. They would keep them at the bay just to trade and then force them to turn back. It wasn't until European diseases spread through the continent that 95% of the indigenous population passed away, and that's when the first colonies began in the U.S., so that's why we now have the misconception of there always having been lots of open land. In general, there are tons of misconceptions about Native Americans and colonial history. I recommend the book 1491 by Charles C. Mann, which clears up a lot of these misconceptions. It's where I got the above information from as well. Story 18. Not fake, but the Boston Massacre was not evil redcoats shooting peaceful American protesters. That protest was anything but peaceful. It was basically a riot. They were throwing rocks and other objects at the redcoats, trying to goad them into something. The soldiers probably had orders not to, but they were outnumbered and scared, so finally they fired. They were arrested and tried. John Adams, the future second president, defended them in court. And won! Story 19. I haven't seen this on here yet, but no one in the town of Salem was actually burnt at the stake during the witch trials. Most of them were to the sky, muhaha, with one being crushed under rocks. But with most of the kids in school now reading The Crucible, I think this'll start being more well-known. Edit. Grammar. For those who really, really care. Edit 2. I'm not very informed, so I'm not surprised that people have been reading The Crucible long before my school or the school before it has. It was written in 1958, after all. Edit 3. To the sky, hanged, to the sky, etc. The only crime here is me getting more upvotes than the question. Story 20. How Spartans suited up for battle and fought against Xerxes. Contrary to what the movie 300 showed, they wore heavy bronze armor not battle thongs and boots. Shields had a red lambda painted on them. Only high-level officers had red plumes on them. Cows expensive guys. Not everyone can have them. At Thermopylae, the movie shows only 300 Spartans. 
There were actually about 1,000 to 1,200 allies that helped and rotated in and out of battle. The battle was to stall the Persian advance to build up forces at Salamis. They rarely ever broke formation, like never. They maintained the phalanx discipline. In the movie, you see them breaking formation a lot, especially in that slow-mo scene where Leonidas terminates like ten in a row. They were not ripped dudes. More disciplined and athletic, but not every single one was Jack. Edit. Bronze armor, not brass armor. Story 21. The Mayflower's passenger list comprised the pilgrims and the crew. In reality, out of the 120 passengers, only 30 were pilgrims. The rest were crew and strangers who came for the adventure and economic reasons. Only about one-third of the Leiden congregation even made it to Plymouth Colony. The rest remained in Holland and assimilated into that society or returned to England. There are descendants of that congregation living in Holland today and may not even know it. These settlers didn't invite the natives to their harvest feast. The natives showed up because they heard a commotion and thought the settlers were under attack and stayed. The whole natives helping the pilgrims thing wasn't altruistic. It was purely political. There were several tribes vying for control of the region, and one tribe wanted the Englishmen with the guns on their side. The colony wasn't this happy, hardy group who stuck together to help found a nation. Some of them went back to England. After a few years, some of them left to found new towns elsewhere in Massachusetts. There was constant infighting between the saints and the strangers. One guy became a sailor and visited England so often he had two families, one in Plymouth Colony, one in England. One of the Mayflower passengers was hanged. It's surprising how much is left out of the narrative. Story 22. One from America would be that the famous Johnny Appleseed, out of the goodness of his heart, walked across much of the USA and even a bit into Canada, planting apple orchards to provide the locals with healthy apples. In reality, he was an eccentric who had financial means and was a shrewd businessman. Yes, he did, in fact, walk around barefoot with a cooking candy on his head. That much is true. Johnny Appleseed, known as John Chapman to his mother, was planting orchards in areas he believed people would soon move as westward expansion grew across the Midwestern U.S. But the apples he planted were nonsense. They were used to make cider and only to make cider. They were sour and not edible. People eventually moved to those lands, as he predicted, and he paid them to look after his orchards and harvest the apples he sold to breweries. Story 23. The drought that preceded the 1930s Dust Bowl was entirely to blame. Actually, it was the fault of the farmers, struggling with the Great Depression, who were trying to increase their crop yields by replanting mature crops into the deeper soil, then planting younger crops on top. The soil turned to dust because there the crops sucked out all of the soil's nutrients faster than it could be replenished, even with fertilizers. Had there been normal rainfall, the soil would have lasted a one year, maybe two. The drought just made the Dust Bowl happen sooner, but it was going to happen anyway because of poor farming practices. Story 24. A women's place has always been in the home. For thousands of years, women did basically whatever her husband did, whether that be farming, baking, brewing alcohol, sewing clothes, or selling things in the market. Sometimes the man would take the stuff to the market, while the woman stayed on the farm to tend to the animals or crops and vice versa. The only professions women did not take part in were law, politics, and military work. And even this was only kind of true as women influenced their husband's politics and were expected to help during sieges, which happened a lot. The idea that a women's place is taking care of the house and not working is a 19th century idea that came about after the Industrial Revolution. Story 25. Indigenous person here. Scrolled a lot and didn't see it. Just going to leave this here because if you do any reading of the last 100 years from an arbitrary perspective that take all sides into account, you'll see it's true. That the forced, government-sanctioned genocide and cultural erasure of the indigenous American population ended somewhere in the 1800s. People legitimately believed that reservations were a choice. That they're nice places where we live out the noble savage trope. After having spent half my life on one and being pretty well-traveled in the world, eight can honestly say... I have seen people in developing nations, what some call the third world, with easier access to food, clean water, transportation, and housing or actual owned property. The rates on reservations are almost triple that of an American city or state. And newsflash, if you didn't catch it, there aren't an awful lot of us left. We're a significant 2% part of the population that by and large lives food insecure and in abject poverty. Almost every reservation in this country is considered a food desert by the federal government. Add that to the fact that the areas we live near are often violent and angry towards us, 
and actively and successfully petitioning the federal government to zone out land and property so that they can use it for farming or oil infrastructure or any number of things. They're getting away with it. No one cares for the most part. It's an acceptable genocide in the greatest country on earth. Mind you, that's not mentioning residential schools, lack of access to public education, lack of access to basic medical attention, lack of access to drinkable water because of pipelines, outright sabotage, fracking nearby, etc. Oh, and my favorite! When people find out you're any type of native, the first cow they say, because that's acceptable at us too, Look at any Thanksgiving situation with hundreds of white kids mocking the ceremonial religious garb of our ancestors at an event that led to the death of millions. Is, wow, you must get a casino check, huh? First off, fudge you. We should be getting a lot more than something we had to destroy tribal land for just so white people can get drunk and gamble. Second, no. Last time I checked, because they disappear pretty regularly each year, there are 247 registered tribes in North America. Out of those 70 tribes have a casino. I think 50 of those do tribal profit sharing. The average person that gets a check is getting under 300 bucks a month. Woo, doggy, really rolling in it, aren't we? Just raking it in. Totally fair trade for constant government-sanctioned murder and police brutality. You know we're the only people it's legal to use tear gas against in this country? They do it fairly often. It's a chemical weapon outlawed in the Geneva Convention. But I have the empty canister that was fired at me. I'm not going to carry on with this. Most people won't even look at it. I could scream it in the middle of rush hour traffic or in someone's ear until they heard it. The fact is, we're the dirty American secret that the population chooses to ignore. You're willfully ignorant about it. You know, you know most of the things I'm saying. The rest are a quick Google search and some non-white written blogs and books away. Fact of the matter is, terminating us made space for you. That's the bottom line. You don't want to feel bad for the space you occupy, so you block it out and carry on without thinking about it. We're human beings. We aren't a mythological creature that was wiped out in the Old West. We exist, we're suffering, and we need people to notice. I don't know if that's ever going to happen, but I write something like this every so often. Maybe it'll help someone. Story 26. A big myth is that the blood stripe worn on the dress pants of United States Marine Corps NCOs, staff NCOs, and officers came from the bloodshed in the Battle of Chapultepec. That, however, is false. The origins coming a couple years prior to the battle when the Marine Corps decided to adopt them as an additional uniform item. This known fact is whispered from ear to ear, but many Marines refuse to believe due to the cultural impact of the fable. Story 27. That the Founding Fathers is a meaningful, coherent group of timeless sages rather than a collection of politicians who acted for political reasons and disagreed with one another. Some people who are technically Founding Fathers are obscure nobodies. Who the hell cares about Button Gwinnett? There was great diversity of thought at the Constitutional Convention. James Madison considered the equal apportionment of the United States Senate to be a defeat. James Wilson has been relegated to obscurity, but was among the most learned and respected members of the convention who in exasperation asked, Can we forget for whom we are forming a government? Is it for man or for the imaginary beings called states? A great deal of popular conception of the founding and those who did it is rooted in misconception or outright falsehoods. 